I have dedicated my professional career to the study and control of arthropods. Okay, so I'm going to, this, this next uh, section five here is going to cover the evolution of sex. Um, sex as in male-female, um, which is another term for that is anisogamy. Um, and a, uh, the evolution of sexual reproduction itself. Um, both of those together I'm going to try to tackle. Um, the reason I talk about, I say uh, anisogamy is a better term than male and female, um, is that uh, the terms male and female, while they're obviously distinct and easy to understand when we're looking at oh, mammals, for example, um, it becomes a little bit... They, the concepts become a lot more vague when we're dealing with um, the lower animals, the invertebrates, or or when you're dealing with plants or fungi or proteists. And isogamy is a good descriptor. Male, female, not... They are, but not as we would recognize them as such. So I'm hoping I can get this. I um, in when I taught, I taught a, a course called Introduction to Selection Theory, which was essentially a class evolution. It was a class on evolution, and I did a, a, a I really liked how it turned out. A great PowerPoint presentation on the evolution of sex and sexual reproduction. Um, unfortunately, I have no idea where that is. Um, somewhere on some backed up drive someplace. I'm sure it exists. I have no idea where it is. I, I searched all over for it and I couldn't find it, which is really unfortunate because it would have been pretty cool if I could just put up some, uh, or at least take some screen caps of my PowerPoint, put those up instead of just me talking. Um, so you don't look at my ugly ass all, while I'm doing this. I mean, actually, better graphics would have explained it a lot better, but I'm hoping I can get this point across. Okay. Um, it's pretty pretty hefty. So, when we talk about sexual reproduction, first of all, the definition of sexual reproduction is two cells, right? Each containing a haploid number of chromosomes, okay? Chromosomes come in pairs. A haploid number is half the number of chromosomes of the mature or the of the the main organism. That's not exactly accurate. But anyway, haploid, half the chromosomes, haploid, half the chromosomes. They come together, they fuse, the chromosomes mix, creating a new individual, okay? This is not, as I saw a video by, uh, was it Kent Hovind, where he, just, he, he was mixing this up with the DNA strand unraveling and then raveling back up with another DNA strand. It has nothing to do with that. Um, this, is a, this is chromosomes, paired chromosomes matching up, okay? In many cases, the, what, w this, is the, this is where it becomes complex because we... Um, humans, mammals, animals for the most part, um, plants for the most part, complex life that we understand um, is what's called, uh, are called diploid organisms. That means that we have two pairs of every chromosome in our bodies, one from our mother, one from our father, okay? Most living things only have, well, okay, that's, that's inaccurate. Okay, I'm not going to, I don't want to say that. Most uh, basic forms of life, it's probably the way life is meant to be, if you can say that, um, is haploid. So we say diploid because we think, you know, diploid, haploid, haploid's the abnormal form. In reality, haploid's probably all primitive life was haploid. All primitive eukaryotes were haploid, okay? Just understand that. Um, so what happens is, is that so you got two two amoebas. I, I, I don't I don't think amoebas amoeboids do this necessarily. Um, I'm sure some of them do. A, a single celled animal, single celled plant, single celled fungi, um, single celled organism of some kind or another that lives its whole life in this haploid form. Okay, whole life. The majority of its existence is haploid. That's the real thing. Real. I'm not. That's probably not the best term. You know, like I said, an amoeba crawls around, eats things. A, cl a chlamydomonas swims around, photosynthesizes. Euglena, paramecium. Any of these little single-celled creatures. Now, when they want to reproduce, they s divide into two, right? Producing an identical clone. Most of them do that, or at least a good number of them do that. Um, however, that's not the only way that they can reproduce. 
they can repro another way they reproduce is they find another individual remember these there's are identical you know they two amoebas that look exactly alike as far as we can tell two paramecium whatever come together and they fuse their body walls their single cell fused into one membrane their nuclei their chromosomes uncoil ravel unravel fuse together okay forming this this mix for that instant they are a diploid organism okay they they are now in the diploid phase of their life during the diploid phase genes transfer pieces break off of each chromosome and transfer back i mean there's a there's a reshuffling of genetic okay it happens you know j j j things get mixed up during this process okay so at some point in time they break apart again sometimes while they're in that diploid form they actually clone more and make a whole bunch of identical diploid cells and then those individual cells break back apart again into the the, the the haploid form not always okay but it's now what's left is two individuals that are not the same individual as first came together in essence that individual both of those individuals are dead there's the reason in biology we say that sex the evolution of sex meant the evolution of death death came into the world there's something there's some Genesis thing there, I'm sure. Um, a smart Christian could, 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 or a, a, one of the Abrahamic religions could come up with a, a, a nice way to, you know, use that. The evolution of sex meant the evolution of death. And think about it this way: before sex, when you had single-celled animals, they cloned. Which one's the real one? Which one's the original? Okay. You know, they clone, you squash one, did you kill it? There's one still that's identical. That clones again, you squash another one. Clones again, you squash another one. In essence, single-celled animal might be thought of that, that only asexually reproduces is kind of an immortal. Okay? You've, it, it's, just, you're, it's constantly cloning itself. At what point in time does it actually die? Once sexual reproduction becomes mandatory, then true death enters two individuals they fuse together they separate they're now two different individual things they go on their way bud produce offspring whatever they come together again reshuffle genes with another individual they're dead again sex is death um i think that's that's pretty profound um but anyway i'm kind of gonna ramble on about this holy smokes so that's kind of that's the basics of sexual reproduction and the question, one of the things we've, when we look at it, to look at the origin of sexual reproduction is to look at um, cases where it is rare. Things that only asexually reproduce, but rarely they sexually reproduce. So then we can say, well, what rare conditions lead to this? Why would they, well, voluntarily die? Or maybe it's not voluntary. And one of the cases, one of the interesting ones that was discovered um, is actually in a single-celled animal that lives inside the guts of a termite. Normally, they happily digest cellulose, and they're you know they live their lives as happy little little ciliates, unless they start starving to death. Meaning, for whatever reason, the termites aren't eating. They're not. They're not. The termites are stressed. The um, their little animals are stressed. They start to die. What they start doing at that point in time is they start consuming each other. They start enveloping each other. The strongest one eats all the others. They found that not always, not always, but once in a while, while one's eating the other one, there's a defense mechanism that the one being eaten can use, which is attach its chromosomes to the one that's feeding on it. Okay? In other words, it's like, you're going to kill me. I'm going to die. I'm going to lose 100% of my genome is extinct. Unless... I fuse to your genome. And then, even when you pull me apart, half of me is still alive. Half of my genome is still out there in the world. It's not a total loss. It's making the best of a bad situation. Um, we find that in, um, in these things. So that might be one 
explanation for the origin of of why sex this fusion of, of chromosomes occurs in the first place. Okay, I I don't want to. I had a, some video problems here. I'm gonna uh, stop this and take this up in the next part because um, this is pretty pretty critically important.